really a joy uh, to be here, uh, <clears throat> mainly because, uh, as Manju said, uh, for 22 plus years, I have been in uh, this uh, vegan lifestyle, which is uh, self-evolved uh, for me. And I would like to share my personal experiences and some uh, uh, dabbling with the spirituality also. Like Swami said, uh, spirituality is everything, especially when it starts manifesting and uh, and on, into the different fields, compassion, and all those things really start bringing the results. And on top of that, uh, Swami said, uh, waking up early. <laughs> so you, I'll go through my life story. So that way uh, we can uh, really correlate everything to what Swamiji also has said. Okay, <laughs> sorry about some technical glitches. Uh, so uh, here I am uh, presenting uh, my life journey, uh, as I said, more than 50% of my professional life has been devoted towards the whole food plant-based diet and with the right reasons. And I am a self-evolved vegan. In those days, uh, hardly there was any onset of people going vegan and those kind of things. Vegan name was coined, but uh, I, I took it very seriously because uh, I really wanted to do whatever is possible for my patients. So this is where the aligning of your body, mind, and spirit comes. And the whole food uh, plant-based diet is uh, 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 one of the best ways to get in, in that state. Uh, I really thank you, Manju, for uh, allowing me to give a nice talk in a nice platform here. And I really appreciate Swamiji to really <laughs> basically back up what I'm gonna say. And, uh, and thank you to Arya Samaj. Uh, one of its uh, main principle is to increase the the physical, the social, and uh, and the spiritual uh, well-being of the, the community. So uh, after retired, uh, I'm retired after 37 years of practice. And as I said, I've been self-evolved. I, I have been highly successful in, in my own life, as well as a lot of my patients uh, who have benefited with this uh, lifestyle. So I'm going to present this and see uh, how uh, it appeals to you. So uh, vegan diet, pretty much everybody knows that there is no animal products in that, uh, but there is a, a stark a difference between a vegan diet and a healthy vegan diet. Both are animal free. So there is no meats or no dairies, no eggs, no cheese, nothing like that. But vegan diet still includes unhealthy foods uh, like concentrated carbohydrates, sugary drinks, oil, fried stuff, and all that. Versus a healthy vegan diet, we heavily recommend uh, whole grains, leafy vegetables, fruits, nuts, legumes, etc. So we'll see how it goes uh, further up. And my life has been divided uh, into several questions. And uh, these questions, I take them seriously, uh, only because uh, if the question comes and leaves, it doesn't do any change in your life. But for me, question was combined with passion to find uh, further more about the answers. And I use the method of uh, inquiry and introspection. Inquiry is very important, which we call shravan in uh, Sanskrit. So you gather, it's not just listening, but you gather all your information from where? From whatever source you can collect, you should collect all the information. And then introspection is also manan. And then the inquiry starts and ultimately you reach to the truth. And you think that all this restlessness that you have in finding a cause, uh, finding the answer for your question, and you think that finding a truth will alleviate your restlessness, but no. Then comes even a bigger step that truth, you have to put it in action. Because truth, if it is not put in action, then it's gonna make you more restless. So truth ultimately leads to freedom only if you put it in practice. So I would recommend three steps, very important, Shravan, Manan, and Acharan. Like I said, Shravan, you gather this information, but don't stop at this point. And then you do Manan. Manan is where you brood over it, gather all the information, documentaries, whatever information. Today, it's very easy to get all the information before you decide to act on it. Most of the people, they, his, they listen to this and they say, okay, I'm gonna go vegan today. It does not happen. Your mind needs to be convinced. And the mind has 10% superficial and 90% subconscious mind. So until it really starts making a dent in your subconscious mind, you're not gonna change, believe me. So don't rush, but I'm gonna, my job is to present the facts. So first question that I came across was raised by my son. 
and he was hardly eight, nine years old. We came from a Jain family, and they said, why should we, why should we eat only plants and not animals, even though both have life? He was an innocent question. I really didn't have much of an answer. So I really inquired around once I had gone to Siddhachalam, which is a tir, Jain Tirth, and I came across a book written by Michael Tobias. He had a, he had a phenomenal life. Uh, it was a book on life force, and it taught me about the compassion because there is a, plants have a only one sense, the sense of reproduction, versus animals have five senses. Each sense can hurt you. When you go to slaughter a cow, it, it, it hurts us, and it knows that you're coming. So all the senses, it can hear all the banging of your uh, machinery is going to cut, all those things. So that made me realize, and I thought that was the end of my journey into spirituality. But the Michael Tobias is an Irish guy, and I actually met him, and he was a PhD in religions. He traveled all over the world, and he went to Israel to study the Judaism. He went to uh, Bethlehem to study Christianities, and, and he came to India, and he went to Varanasi, studied Hinduism. He came to Kutch. He, convert, he got impressed with Jainism of nonviolence, so he converted himself to be a Jain. He was a Jain monk for a while. Now he's making a lot of films on nonviolence. So this is how he's contributing whatever he has acquired experience through his life. So it was a very fascinating journey. I was fascinated by the book, but I thought that was the end of it, but no. Until I met this lion. This lion was in, uh, uh, in Kruger National Park. I was uh, in, on a safari with my son and my family. And uh, my parents were with us, and suddenly we were following a, a, a herd of lions. And suddenly one lion started running, 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 and was running after a warthog, a small uh, pig-like animal. And then uh, we were just following the lions. He said, what's happening? The warthog ran away, and uh, was running for his life. Lion was running for his food. So uh, lion was coming back. That was the pivotal moment of my life. It was around 5 o'clock and the sun was shining at an angle, and the whole body of a lion was glowing like gold. Every single muscle you could really count. So I was so impressed, and at that time, all this manan started in my mind, that how come, and that raised my second question, why are lions so physically fit, <clears throat> and why we are not? What is the problem? Why, how come the lions, every single lion you find in the jungle are so physically fit, it made me start thinking and made me realize that there are two different lifestyles we're living. One that is can be lived in a jungle, which we all used to live in a jungle, and now we're living in a human society. What is the main difference? I realized that the, the jungle life has no choice. Lion has to be fit. He has to be physically fit. The day he cannot hunt, he dies. Simple as that. And there is no supermarket he can stop by and pick up a piece of meat. There are no grandchildren. They're going to feed their grandpa just because you cannot uh, do the hunting. Let me bring the meat for you. It doesn't work that way. You have to be fit. And supposing I lived in a jungle, what would I do? What would I eat? I'll climb the trees. If I come out of my cave and, and look for food, there is no refrigerator. There is no pantry full of food. What will I do? I'll walk four miles, five miles, whatever it takes until I reach a fruit tree. Then I have to climb the tree, throw the stones, and I get a raw apple. What am I gonna do, complain? No, eat it. So jungle life is a life without choices. We think that we have become civilized, but we call it civilization, but we have just kept on adding more and more choices. And when you have two choices to make, you always make a wrong choice. And that is the problem. So I realized that jungle life versus civilized Life is the only difference is one has choicelessness and one is full of choices. It all depends what we call good or bad. And you will listen to my rest of the life story based on that. So I learned the lesson from the lion that I'm going to remove the man-created choices just because, just because. And that second thing is to, I have to stay physically fit. I have to exercise. The day I don't exercise, I don't eat. I, I just made these rules based on the, on the life of a lion. I already, this was around when I was 46 years old. That was in August, we were in Kruger National Park. I had been started running because my cholesterol triglycerides were high. 
And I had started running at the age of 33. I could not run at the age of 33. Two minutes and I'll get out of breath. So I, I said, I can't give it up at the age of 33, cannot run it. So I'm gonna keep gradually build up. So two minutes run, two minutes walk, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. I started running almost half an hour without stopping. So gradually I build up. That's when I understand what Swamiji said, then you have to do the patience at 7.45, you have to, eight o'clock, you have to start. So you have to wake up early. This waking early, but starting subconsciously, changing my inner mindset. And then as you see, I even started running marathon. So those things also add more time. And I moved out of the area where I used to live. So all these things really started transforming my life. So staying physically fit and eating the foods like you eat in a jungle. What would you eat in a jungle? Fruits, leaves, seeds, nuts, legumes, and how much exercise would you do for it? A lot. So then the question came about, what do you do about the milk? Milk is pretty much part of our uh, lifestyle. And then as I was pondering on that question, suddenly I saw this wild cow. I said, there is no way I'm gonna go to this cow and milk, milk the cow. Before I know, I'll be dead. In the wild, mother protects her own milk for only for her own baby. It will die in that process, but will not give you a drop of milk. That was the revolution. So I said, the, that means the milk is just created by the human society. It's not necessarily a normal thing to drink milk. So that day I stopped dairy. My final decision was whole food, plant-based diet. Then as I continued, I started recommending this to my patients also because I just believed in this lifestyle. And I really started enjoying it. People were getting a totally new approach instead of just prescribing medications. And I would spend almost half an hour, 40 my, 45 minutes to explain to these people that these are the problems that we all have diseases because of this. So the question will come is, Doc, we know that. What, we know what to do, but we can't do it. So now that started another question. Why can't we do it? Mind knows something, but cannot do it. What is the problem? Because between mind and the body, body is not smart, it's dumb. It doesn't have a brain of its own. Mind thinks, mind is smarter. So mind tells the body what to do. If, mind is, if the body is sick, say, okay, let's go to the doctor, get it fixed. So mind is superior. But if the mind has a problem, what do you do? I never knew that. I didn't have any answer. How do you fix your mind? When mind itself, body cannot fix itself. How come mind cannot fix itself either, I guess? So that's when I came across beautiful uh, Bhagavad Gita by Chin Manan, and it got me very much deep. Just reading this book took me six months to finish, and each page took me like 45 minutes, an hour to grasp and understand, because my technique was to do the introspection how the patients are suffering, how I am suffering, all this thing. And what this knowledge is, what is the importance of this knowledge in context with all these things? So it took me a long time to finish this reading. But then, of course, I read so many other books. I just kept reading it. Then I started realizing there is something called soul. And this soul is supposedly superior than the mind. But I didn't know what the soul was. I started meditating. All these things started from one question from the patient, said, Doc, I can't do it. So it's, it's, it started defining my path very well. I came across this quote from Jiddu Krishnamurti, the freedom to choose is great, but freedom from your choices is the ultimate freedom. We were enslaved by the British and Mughals, right? So we became free from them. That was a great freedom to have. That's the freedom at the physical level. But the enemies are within. Jainism says the same thing, four kasais, mad, moh, krod, maya. Those are hidden inside you. The choices that we're making, the wrong choices obviously in the human society are also hidden in our mind. <clears throat> and when you become free from your mind, that's the ultimate freedom. So I started working towards that. Then I read, Gita of course says a lot of things about what you should be eating. One of the things that really appealed to me, what Krishna said was do sattvic ahar, sattvic vichar, and sattvic achran. 
Swamiji said, then I give you guarantee of 100 years of healthy life. Such a beautiful statement. But what is sattva? Do we know what is sattva? Sattva means purity. Anytime an apple growing on a tree is sattvic, there is no label on it. Who made it? God made it. The day we bring it home and put all kind of stuff in it, make an apple pie, sattva is gone. That is a sattvic. Children are sattvic. They are pure, innocent. As they grow older, they lose the sattva. People living in a village, they are innocent. They come to the cities, they find out the crooked ways to survive, and there they become a sattvic. So sattva is a purity, not just the food, but your thoughts and your heart. Everything has to be at the sattvic level. And that's what Swamiji said, swasthya. The one who settles sthi means to, to become steady in your soul. So I started understanding the richness of our scriptures and wisdom that was there, which was thousands of years back. There was no, you know, this kind of lifestyle was not even developed, and yet the wisdom was there. So I started uh, admiring these scriptures so much and put them in a daily life. So sattvic food, sattvic vichar, and sattvic acharam, Krishna says, 100 years. So then in my mind, it was all settled. Sattvic food means whole food, plant-based diet. I ran marathons. One of the marathons I ran was New York. And I got an email, and that was, again, sattvic, believe it or not. It had no name sattva or anything, but my, my mind was now getting very crystallized. The soul does it. It gives you crystal clarity. And the sattvic food, to me, was a whole food, plant-based diet. But guess what? What I got as an email, because I was running, so Roadrunner Club of New York would send you all these emails. And one of the emails said, don't think that you're just running a marathon. You are a marathoner. So live your lifestyle like that. Eat the food without labels. There you go. Carrots don't have labels because they have nothing to hide. Carrot is a carrot is a carrot. Apples are sattvic. Fruits are sattvic. Leaves are sattvic. Whole food plant-based diet on a jungle is sattvic food. And that's what Marathon are where they were recommending. That's the most trustworthy and the most healthiest food to eat. Even Bhagavad Gita says on this chapter 9, slok 26, patram pushpam phulam phalam toyam. Whoever with the great devotion offers me four things, a leaf, a flower, a fruit, and water. There is no meat there. There is no dairy there. Krishna, the consciousness. We don't have physical form of Krishna with us, but we do have Krishna, the consciousness within us. We can turn to anytime. So when the consciousness is saying that give me only four things, this was the highest state when Krishna delivered. He was not a shepherd boy anymore, doing what his mother was telling me, eating yogurt and drinking milk and all that. He was mature. That's when he was delivering the highest form of consciousness was Gita itself. And this is what he says. So Ayurveda, Swamiji, we are going on the parallel path. I'm not claiming to be you know, trained in Ayurveda, nothing, and neither I had any, because I was fully trained in Western medicine. but. I came across the real meaning of Ayurveda, as Swamiji would easily say, Ayu is your life, Veda is science. They think about your whole life. How to prevent disease is more important. That's why we have yoga and meditations and asanas and pranayam, all those things to prevent. And we have meditation too, dhyan. All these things are there. After all that, if there is a disease, they will treat. But the Western medicine, as it says, bring me the disease, I give you medicine, simple. And this is how the Western culture has been going. And I was trained in Western medicine. It started bothering me. So Ayurveda had a, definitely a better idea how to handle your life. Even Benjamin Franklin said, out of wisdom, pound, out of prevention is worth pound of cure. So what is wrong with animal foods? Because jungle diet told me we should not be consuming any animal products. And the studies after studies have shown that there is a, it causes metabolic syndrome, high cholesterol, diabetes, heart disease, obesity, many cancers, hypertension. Even there has been a link between neurological disease and animal food, and even psychological disorders like anxiety, ADHD, depression, etc. 
So all these things can be prevented if you go on a whole food plant-based diet. It, it, you may not take my words for it, but believe me, I have gone through this journey myself. I would tell my patients, I said, you come to me, say, doc, how can I do that? I said, okay, I'll give you an example. You are hungry, I'm hungry. You come to my office, I have only two things to offer you. Carrot or carrot cake, what would you choose? Come on, doc, we'll take carrot cake. I said, okay, fine, no problem. I'll have carrots. So, <laughs> so uh, we eat to our heart's content. I'm fill, filled up, you're filled up, and you leave the room. What happened to you? What is your mind? Now you like the carrot cake. Your mind has inflated. You have more thoughts. Now you go home. Two days later, you call me. Doc, where did you buy that carrot cake from? Then, then you're going to go and pick it up. Then you will enjoy. Your wife will enjoy. Your children will enjoy. Your friends will enjoy. Before you know, in three, four months, I will have 100 patients walking into my office they, because they are eating this carrot cake, gain a lot of weight. Their cholesterol is high. Sugar is high. I'm just making a scenario. I said, now think of me. My mind is pure. There is nothing addictive in the nature. Nobody, I haven't seen anybody getting addicted to carrot. Next day, if I'm hungry, I'll eat cucumber, cauliflower, whatever I eat, whatever I, but none of them are addictive. Addiction is a man-made phenomenon. And this is what we are paying the price for. So just to make it. So when I was going through and recommending, all of a sudden, one of my patients came to me and he was in a pesticide business. He came and gave me this book, Diet for New America, written by John Robbins. Guess what? Son of Baskin Robbins. He's vegan. <laughs> he told his father, he says, I'm walking away with your multi, multi-billion dollar empire. I don't want any penny out of it because he had realized this is where the problem is. He had, because of his profession, he had access to all the animal industry, how these animals are kept, and what atrocities are being committed on those things, he had a first-hand experience. If you read this book and not cry, you are not a human being. There is awful, awful lot of, lot of cruelties going on. But more than anything, and the patient told me, he said, Doc, this is all you've been telling us what to eat, and now you, it's in a book form. But more than a, in a book form, he had also presented a lot of scientific data. And that's what I was lacking so far, because so far it was all conceptual thing and my in thinking, but I did not have any. So in that, he predicted in 1980, it was a bestseller book, he predicted that there's gonna be a major epidemic of breast cancer in this country. At that time, one out of 10 women were getting breast cancer. Now, one out of seven women are getting breast cancer. Imagine 300 million people in the US, half of them female, it's, it's a big deal. So my path was fixed. But one thing, I could not figure it out, that why animal foods are linked with so many diseases. We knew from Framingham study, which was started way back, that cholesterol is the culprit for one of the things, for the heart disease. But what is cholesterol? That was my question number five. I didn't know. In med schools, unfortunately, doctors don't get trained nutritionally, which they should. But there, maybe there is politics or maybe under the Western influence, treatment is more important than prevention. Nobody, so I started asking myself, I did not know. So finally I had to go to Dr. Google. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it said cholesterol is an organic molecule. It's a sterol, it's a fatty molecule. All the animal cells, cell membrane is made out of cholesterol. So that was very eye-opening moment for me because that means we are cholesterol. Every single cell in our body is made out of cholesterol. Cholesterol is very essential for your body. That means how we age, we keep making new cells, keep shedding old cells, that's how we get older. As we keep, at some point when we cannot manufacture cholesterol, we die. If I have to kill someone, all I have to do is give them a pill, a very powerful pill, which doesn't exist, that will bring the cholesterol to zero, he will die because cholesterol is extremely important. That's how we grow. So cholesterol is an, ex but at the same time, what did it mean to my theory of not eating the animal foods? That means all animals are also made out of cholesterol. If you eat their meat, 
it's cholesterol. If you drink their milk, it's cholesterol. So every time you eat any kind of meat, chicken, fish, lamb, goat, whatever, it doesn't matter, they all have cholesterol. If you drink milk, cheese, butter, yogurt, ghee, it's all cholesterol. By doing this, what are we doing? We adding cholesterol to our body, which already is smart enough to make its own cholesterol. And yet, if you go into the, big, uh, read the labels, there is RDA, recommended daily allowance for cholesterol. Why? To support the animal industry. Who defines all these RDAs? The government does. And then it gets printed all over, making you believe, oh, I have to eat cholesterol. No, you don't have to. I am the proof. 20 years, I haven't had any cholesterol intake. No problem. So one steak, 149 milligrams of cholesterol, half a fillet of salmon that people are made to believe that fish is so healthy, half a fillet, 112 milligrams of cholesterol, one cup of milk, 24, one cup of cheese, 10 times. 10 cups of milk equals to one cup of cheese. 256 milligrams of cholesterol. Yogurt, 24. So one egg, 187 milligrams of cholesterol. So we are adding cholesterol after cholesterol, after meal, after meal, and then what do we do? We go for a pill. That's not a solution. Don't eat cholesterol. Even the fish oil that lately, thank God, the study came out that it is no, no longer believed to be preventing a heart disease. But for so many years, it had been recommended to take the fish oil. Even fish oil has cholesterol, one teaspoonful, 104. But if you switch to the plant-based diet, zero cholesterol. And I Googled that too, because I had a lot of patients would come and tell me, Doc, definitely cashew has cholesterol, right? I said, no. I Googled everything. You check out everything, there is zero cholesterol on a plant-based diet. So by going on a plant-based diet, you are stopping the cholesterol from coming in your body. And then whatever happens and you still have it, you need a pill, so that's a different story. Ayurveda, prevent the disease first. So all the plants are zero cholesterol because the cell walls in the plants are made out of cellulose, which is fiber. Fiber is actually good for you because this fiber actually brings your cholesterol down. So I was ready with this kind of statistics, my mentality, suddenly a poster child walks into my office. Her name was Marie, and she came, she traveled almost three and a half hours to come see me. I said, that doesn't sound right. Why did you travel so much to come see me? Oh, because my mother is in the next town, Montclair, and she heard you're a good doctor. She's not your patient, but by the way, I have this asthmatic bronchitis. Can you take care of it? I said, okay, we'll take care of it. But meanwhile, as we finished all these things, and she says, doc, my cholesterol is very high. Her ex was Italian. She had just come back from Italy, and she ate, they ate everything. So he says, my cholesterol, I said, how much? He says, my bad cholesterol, the sticky cholesterol, LDL, is 173. I said, what did your doctor say? He says, well, she's telling me to go on a medication. And uh, I said, well, uh, did you get a second opinion? And she said, yeah. I went to an endocrinologist who said the same thing. So here I am. I don't want to take a pill. What do you recommend? So I, I started smiling because my background was already built up. So I said, all right, I'm going to ask you uh, just one question. If you try to catch something and it runs away, what would you do? What would you do? I asked 100 people, 99% people says, we'll run after. She didn't say that. She got the message. She said, I will let it go. Animals have legs. They're trying to run away for their life. We are forcing ourselves onto them to get something from them. That's just not natural. That's not physiological. So she got the answer. Believe it or not, she became vegan that night. And she sent me, she must know some, some of our words. She texted me, Danyabad, shukriya, thank you. My cholesterol dropped 105 points. Look at the LDL of 173 dropped to 68 in six weeks. She must have got it checked at a supermarket or something. So, so that was really eye-opener. And then I became a full-fledged you know, supporter of whole food plant-based diet. Animal foods have a high much, very much connected with the heart disease. Heart disease is one of the worst, uh, you know, the, the blame to be for the total deaths in all over the world 
Even in US alone, every 36 seconds, somebody dies from a heart disease. One in four deaths are from the heart, and it cost us $219 billion every year. If you look at the study, there is a total mortality of how many people, I mean, how, how many diseases people die by. 30% of those diseases are nothing but heart disease. Uh, but even in those 30%, 60% are South Asians. That's us. Indians, Vietnamese, Bangladeshi, whatever, Pakistan. All those South Asians are the leading cause, leading disease to be dying from is the heart disease. We are the highest contributor for the heart disease. And it's very unfortunate. So this Masala study came out from uh, uh, California, Dr. Kanaya. She's amazing. She did, she specifically studied because this, she realized, and we have already realized that Asians are a special subgroup, which does not behave like the Westerners do. They have a different genetic pool. So they did this study and they found out that a lot of people, South Asians, they die early from the heart disease. And they have the early plaque formations in their arteries. They found out they also have a high incidence of diabetes, high level of uh, LP little a, which is again a bearer of the heart disease. They also have a high calcium scoring. But look at the last one. Many were, the, the studies, the, the, the people they studied, the many were vegetarians. And their was, diet was very high in dairy and very low in fruits and vegetables. So the, our diet is to be blamed. So if you go travel all over the world, uh, there is no heart disease you will find in certain parts of the world, like Central Africa, Papua New Guinea, rural China, Okinawa, Sardin Sardinia, even Lom Loma Linda University and, and the surrounding area. I don't know if you have watched the, the, the documentary Blue Zone. This is all they talk about. Even uh, Singapore is one of the blue zones where they are consuming a lot of whole food plant-based diet. This is the reason. So it can be done even in US alone, it can be done. And they have proven it that people are living longer and not just living longer, but a healthy lifestyle. That's our goal, right, Swamiji said. So <clears throat> what are we doing with the current cardiovascular treatments? All we're doing is keep repeating the blood works, cholesterols, liver enzymes, blood sugars. We keep giving statins, beta blockers, all those medications we give. And then there are complications of those medications, high sugar, myopathies, neuropathies, hemorrhages, all those things. Even bypass surgeries, we perform half a million bypass surgery. There is a 3% fatality rate. So 15,000 people died on, die just because of the surgery itself. That's iatrogenic death. And angioplasties, we perform 1 million. And 1.2% people die from angioplasty alone. So 27,000 people just dying in the treatment alone, which is very pathetic. But all these things can be prevented if everybody goes on a whole food plant-based diet. Heart disease is just absolutely cannot appear if you are on a whole food plant-based diet. I'll show you the proof later on. Dean Ornish from California was one of the pioneer of whole food plant-based diet. And it showed that study was small, 48 people, but it showed the 82% regression. Now mind well, all the statins, they only prevent the further progress, but they do not regress. The staying on a whole food plant-based diet, oil-free diet, he showed there is a regression in 82% and 91% reduction in angina, chest pains and all that. But the control group kept on having whatever they were destined to have. This is interesting anecdote, 1941, Second World War. Norway was occupied by Germans. And this is what they, the winners do. They go and collect all the animals for, the, for feeding their, their soldiers, right? So next four years, Norwegians by force went on a plant-based diet and their heart, coronary heart disease risk went down by 50%, 58%. So something to, I don't know what happened to the German soldiers. <laughs> so, so there was another study came out in American Journal of Cardiology in 2017. This was a very landmark study to define the path of veganism because there is healthy vegan, there is unhealthy vegan. So 200,000 people were enrolled, 50-50, 100,000 100, went on a animal foods uh, like the normal did. Other 100,000 went on a plant-based diet. And they saw the risk of heart disease going down by 
But on top of that, they divided that group into healthy vegan and unhealthy vegan. The unhealthy vegan where they allowed the oils and refined sugars and all that, their risk went up by 10%. But healthy vegan went down by another 7%. So if you do go vegan in the future, please go for a healthy vegan, which is we already described. Diabetes, another culprit uh, linked to the, to the animal foods, red meat and all those things have linked with a 19% increase. Uh, another uh, really a drainer on our budget, 327 billion we're spending on diabetes alone. Milk, not many people know that, 40% of the calorie of the milk is, comes from lactose. Lactose goes in your body and goes into glucose and galactose. And glucose is glucose. Galactose is a special protein gets stored in your liver, which becomes sugar as soon as you need it. So 40% of the calorie of the milk is nothing but sugar. And then comes to our regular food, one roti, six and a half teaspoonful of sugar, one cup of rice, 18. So the higher amount of fruits you consume, by the way, a lot of people ask me that fruit may have sugar, but their fiber, and as the totality of it actually reduces your risk, risk of diabetes, but not the fruit juices. So whole food plant-based diet is your ultimate diet preached by the lion. <laughs> but uh, what do we do? This is what we do. Milk, cheese, butter, sweets, after sweets, after sweets. <laughs> We're missing out. The most uh, uh, neglected component in our diet is the fiber. Fiber is so important, it comes only from plant-based diet because plants are made out of cellulose. So fiber actually rubs against your inner lining of your intestine. It, it, it rubs and removes the, all the dying cells, allowing the healthy cells to come in the front, which can fight against cancer. But the fiber works like a sponge and it holds on to it. So when you move your bowel, it takes those dying cells. And don't forget, each cell is made out of cholesterol. So that's how it actually reduces your cholesterol. And that's why Qu uh, Quaker Oats say that we reduce cholesterol by 15%. That is the mechanism. So fiber is very important, has a lot of better advantages for the view of time. I'm not gonna go into the detail, but fiber is very important. We recommend about 55 grams of fiber. Most of the Americans as an average diet includes 10 to 15 grams because under the effect of this civilization, we're getting a lot of choices which are removed. Uh, the fiber is removed. Saying all that on October 15th, awakening came. I was not just a doctor anymore. I became a patient. So on October 15th, I had a heart attack. This was two months after the lion woke me up. And then luckily it did not happen in Kruger National Park. It happened in my office. I was brought to the ER and then in two hours it opened up. But at that time, I told the cardiologist, good friend of mine, <laughs> Dr. Gupta, I said, I'm not coming back here again, because all, all was all backed by all this introspection that I had gone through, and I knew exactly how to live life, and which I was already doing. On the day of heart attack, I had run seven, uh, seven miles. So it did not deter me. I kept on going, and on the anniversary of the heart attack, I ran New York Marathon, 26.2 miles. And then many more marathons came after that. I even climbed Kilimanjaro, 20,000 feet, as recently as now, uh, I did Everest Base Camp also in April this year. So that's what Swamiji is saying, living a healthy life is more important than anything else. Thank you. <laughs> so this was my numbers before, and they were shocking as it is. That's how I started running but I did not stop at one point. I just continued. My cholesterol used to be 234. Look at my triglycerides, 700. I had a typical metabolic syndrome, which is very common in Asians. And that pushes your good cholesterol down to 26. But in those days, triglycerides were not considered that important. Oh, watch out, but it doesn't do anything. Now we know it's atherogenic. So with all this lifestyle, and I had reached on the verge of becoming diabetic also, my A1C had gone to 7.5, 7.1, but after all these things, look at the numbers. The, my LDL came down to 70, my A1C came down to 5.4, and uh, my HDL became actually 52 without doing anything, and when I was running marathon, it went to 63. 
So amazing, amazing transformation. But I had to go through that before I tell my patients. I love my patients because they are like French soldiers. You know, they come to you for advice, but if you don't practice what you preach, what's the point? So I had to change myself and then I could tell the patients, but for the patients, oh, my doctor told me that you do this and do that. And like that lady, Nari did, right? So, so far I had achieved the mind and body alignment and my body and mind were functioning beautiful. I was enjoying life, doing yoga, meditation, and all those things, but the, the spiritual was still missing out, which is not an easy fish to catch, if there is anything like catching. So I'll, I'll tell you the rest. So animal foods are also been linked with cancers, a lot of cancers, and like one of the things that uh, John Robbins said was breast cancer. In the milk, there is something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor. What it does, it, it stimulates your sex organs. So when you have a male calf, the mother's milk, because mother's milk is mother's milk, is full of hormones. This is not even added hormones. A cow's milk, any mother's milk, always will have hormones. There are nine hormones in cow's milk, human milk, all the mother's milk has no natural hormones. The job of these hormones, especially the IGF-1, is to go and stimulate the sex centers. So if it's a male calf, it gets stimulated, becomes a bull. A female calf becomes a cow, so it is necessary but that's where their center, sex centers are not stimulated. But we, our sex centers are already stimulated. What's gonna happen to us? They're gonna get overstimulated. And overstimulation leads to cancer. At one time, diethylstilbestrol. Now, this is going beyond that. Animal industry is very, very cruel and cunning. The diethylstilbestrol was routinely injected to the cow until they found out it, it causes breast cancer and it was banned. But like I said, the animal industry is very cruel, cunning, any industry. So they can always tweak the molecule. From, from diethyl, they can make tetraethyl or triethyl, whatever. They keep on doing the business as usual. Until a new study, which will take another 20 years to figure out, they will keep doing it. And meanwhile, we keep suffering. So breast cancer is, is heavily linked with this, but in this country, all we talk about is curing the cancer, curing the cancer, collecting the money, donations, this and that. But nobody talks about preventing, because in prevention, there is no money. But treatments, $15,000 per chemotherapy injection would be worth it. Even in the men, there is an 11% rise in prostate cancer if you consume dairy on a regular basis, on the same basis. So whole food plant-based diet has been known to prevent these cancers, for sure, with the studies have been proven with the lung, con uh, lung colon, ovarian, and breast cancer. What about environment? That's another pathetic story. Then I want to take you somewhere behind what you're doing. The environment, there is something called rule of 10. This is very interesting, which not many people know, but it's been known for so many decades. When my son was in eighth grade, he's 41 now, Rule of 10 was, I came across that. What that means is, and this is scientific rule that has been observed and uh, has been documented as a rule. But nobody can question it. That anytime any organism wants to exchange the calories, they can take only 10%. Like for example, if a chicken wants to eat wheat, it cannot eat the root, cannot eat the stalk, cannot eat the leaves. All it can do is eat the grains, which is 10%. The plant of the wheat holds on to 90% of its own calorie for its own use. It cannot exchange. But look what happens. Now, if a fox wants to eat a chicken, chicken hooves are no good, chicken bones are no good, chicken feathers are no good, chicken beak is no good, all that 90% is gone. The meat coming out of the chicken is only 10%. So if, if a chicken wants to satisfy itself, it cannot satisfy with one plant. It is only 10%, so it will have to use 10 plants. But the same thing with the uh, fox. Fox is not gonna be happy with one chicken. It needs 10 chickens. So indirectly, he's consuming 100 plants of the wheat. And the same thing goes higher on, higher you go on a food chain, it's gonna keep getting worse. Lion needs 10 foxes, 100 chickens, and 1,000 plants of wheat. That's why lions need big territories to survive. Now, how do you put it in practice? The book itself, the biology textbook, at that time, there was no concept of veganism. They said if everybody became vegetarian, 
we will need only 10% of the farmland. Because if we become chicken, vegetarians, so we need only 10, 10 plants to survive. But if we eat chicken, we need 100 plants to survive. And if we can lie like that, it goes on. So from the medical point of view, chemicals, and chemicals are universal nowadays, 10 plants worth of chemicals goes in chicken's body. But 100 plants worth of chemicals go into the fox's body. So people who are not vegetarians and eating meat and animal products, they have 10 times more chance of developing cancers because chemicals cause cancer. Not only that, if the book said that if everybody go vegetarian, only 10% of the farmland will be needed. 90% of the farmland grows the food for the animals we consume. So it's very pathetic statistics. So this rule of 10 applies in the nature also. At one time, the bald eagles were becoming extinct. This is our national bird. And suddenly they realized that it was the DDT that we were spraying on the crops. When we were spraying the DDT, it would go into the runouts, runoffs and into the small streams and ultimately end up in the ocean. Small fish will take it, the bigger fish, the bigger fish, the bigger fish. The bald eagles were highest on the food chain. The DDT was getting accumulated on their eggshells. The eggshells were becoming soft. Before the baby had a chance to hatch, the eggs will break. And bald eagles were losing their babies right and left. So they realized it, the DDT was banned, and now the bald eagles are coming back to life. Now we have more bald eagles in US than even when the pilgrims came, because now they are under protection. So this is the story that should teach us a lesson that the higher you go on a food chain, there are a lot of, lot of chances we're taking. And this is the result of that. This is very pathetic because I just gave a talk at Seva Foundation on the environment, which is really eye-opener. I came across these statistics. If you look at the biomass, you can weigh, for example, this is all calculations <coughs> of humans and then domesticated animals and then wild animals. The domesticated animals have reached up to 630 million tons. And humans are only 390 million. But at what cost? The wild mammals are only 60 million. They're trying to survive. So a lot of land has been destroyed. You know, a lot of forests have been destroyed to create the farmland. And this is the sad story. Same thing, look at the top left. The green is all wild animals. Everything is taken over by humans and domesticated animals. The grains that we grow in US, which are being fed to the cows and all the other animals, if every whole country became vegan, we could feed 1 billion people. This is astronomical waste. India is one of the highest exporter of beef. But look at this. It's also the most least consuming the beef because we consider cows sacred. So we don't consume the beef, but we consume the dairy for sure. We are the highest consumer of dairy products in the world. So this is where really pathetic things happen. Beef takes 1,847 gallons of water for one pound. Tofu needs 303 gallons. So all these statistics are really you know, upsetting. The, the thing that upset me the most was these lagoons. I had never know, known what lagoons are. And lagoons are heavily linked with animal industry. If you look at this lagoon, you can, they want to build a house next to it. It's such a nice you know, red color but it's nothing but a hell. The lagoons are necessary because all the animals we use for our purpose, they have to be fed, like we said, but also they have excretas, the urine and stool, and all these things, the dung, everything is sent into this because they don't have a drainage system like we do. So instead of sending it to the ocean and all that, they have to collect in these lagoons. And these lagoons are filled with uh, hormones and animals' blood and whatnot. And it has its own major, major, major problems. It causes air pollution, water pollution. All the odors are coming out. Even people living nearby have been known to uh, get non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, leukemia, asthma, depression. And the worst part is the number 10. What they do is, after keeping the, this uh, collection for a while, they spray it back into the fields to make a fertilizer out of it. And, that, and this thing is filled with bacteria, listeria, salmonella. That's why you notice in the, uh, in the 
in the, in the news it comes out, listeriosis and salmonellosis, people died and all those things. It comes because of this system. So some scientists call this cesspools of shame. So we are basically needless to say that this is the reason why we're heading into mass extinction number six. This is how the animals are kept in their facilities, drinking milk. Though this thing just opened up my pipe, artificial insemination. In the old days, the cows were left alone, roaming in the fields, and cows will get pregnant on their own, and there's not a thing like that anymore. Cows will be lined up, artificial insemination is routinely done. So one day I was in a deep state of meditation, and then suddenly something sprung within me. I had bypassed the body, bypassed the mind, and I connected with the consciousness, and suddenly made me realize that at the body level, we are all different. At mind level, we are very different. But at the consciousness level, which is formless, we are all the same. My soul and a cow's soul cannot be differentiated. So that day, the question number six arose within me. What do you call pregnancy without consent? What is artificial insemination? There is nothing. Pregnancy is a natural state. Artificial insemination is artificiality. It's ultimate cruelty. But if my mother, my sister, my wife would be subjected to all these things, if in a human society impregnation happens without consent, what would you do? Lifetime in without parole. So this is where I completed my cycle of body, mind, and spirit alignment. So here I was to present it to you. And meanwhile, don't keep doing this anymore, please. <laughs> because behind your pleasures of short time, there is a lot of suffering. And there is more suffering down the road for you also. The last question I'm leaving you is from me to you. Which animal in the world drinks another animal's mother's milk? And that for the whole life. It's just not physiological to drink milk. Even our own mother's milk, we don't drink after six months a year. Cows, babies don't drink anymore. Why are we drinking it? Just ask yourself. This is our picture. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so this is one of my patients. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm gonna skip it in the sheer time. But uh, she really benefited, Christian uh, uh, nun, and uh, she really benefited from the whole food plan. She reversed her diabetes. The next one is, uh, also I have is uh, Clinton video. Clinton himself went vegan uh, uh, after suffering with so many diseases and all that, right? And. Uh, so I will skip that in the essence of time. I know Manjuji has been poking around. Sorry about that. So there are some documentaries. I'm finishing up in two minutes. So there are a lot of documentaries already available. Like I said, do the manan, watch these documentaries. What the hell, Cowspiracy, Game Changers, Walks Over Nice, Hispiracy. And very interesting, a new uh, 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 documentary has come, the first one of its kind from India, um, Makadud. So you really should watch. I have met his uh, creator, Dr. Harsha Atmakuri. He gave up his, he was a doctor. He gave up his practice and devoted himself to uh, awareness, Makadud. So if there are physicians in the group, I will tell them, physician, heal thyself first. This wisdom was from sixth century BC, Medici, Kirati, Ichkan. And people who are not physicians, this is a beautiful quote from Eldridge Clever. If you are not a part of solution, you're part of the problem. Thank you. Sure. No, it's not. Again, you do the research. There is how many bees die you know, in the process of making the honey? Millions and millions. And especially the day, you know, if you're growing in your home, it's, it's still one thing. Just like the farmers were doing their own cows. But the industrialization, corporatization, politicization, as everything on an upscale basis, millions of bees die. It's natural. They're also underfed because they're not, they cannot afford to have them. So they are full of sugary drinks, and so they become weak. Their resistance become weak. So they die from diseases. A lot of times appear. So no. Yes. What's that? Fish is not recommended. Forget about the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the study just came out. It, it doesn't do anything. 
The study just came out, I think, within six months. 